his behavior is shocking. It was shocking to people then. But also, I think if you're looking at the past and something looks nuts, like why is somebody doing this? You really have to take a step back and say, well, what is the context? I'm Gary Samling. For 17 years, I worked at Monticello, and currently I work at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. I'm David Thorson, and I'm a digital guide at Monticello. Welcome to In the Course of Human Events. Today we're going to be talking about Citizen Genet, or what some folks call the Neutrality Crisis of 1793. My name is Lindsay Travinsky. I am a presidential historian, a senior fellow at the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University. I am also the author of The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution. The story of Edmund Charles Genet, the French minister, and the neutrality crisis of 1793 began when France declared war on Great Britain. As a new nation, George Washington and his cabinet knew that the United States had absolutely no business participating in this conflict. The country was just beginning to recover from the emotional, financial, environmental effects of the revolution. And so war was really not an option. So when Washington first learned of France's declaration of war in early April 1793, he sent a letter to the secretaries asking them to start brainstorming about how best to stay neutral in the face of this conflict. He convened a cabinet meeting, and Washington and the cabinet agreed that they had to issue a proclamation saying that they were going to stay friendly with all sides. Now, even though Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of Treasury, and Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson disagreed about pretty much everything at this point, they did agree that neutrality was essential. So that sets the stage for what's going to happen before the arrival of the new French minister. Washington issued this proclamation on April 22nd. A couple of weeks earlier, on April 8th, Edmond Charles Genet, the new French minister to the United States, arrived in Charleston. He had planned to arrive in Philadelphia, but his ship had been blown off course. And so he arrived many hundred miles farther south than he had intended. He was greeted by an overwhelming welcome. The American people were so excited he was there. They threw balls in celebrations. There were toasts upon toasts upon toasts. And I think that this warm welcome kind of made common sense go out of his head because he came and expected that maybe the Americans would be friendly to the French cause. But this welcome caused him to think that the United States would enter the war. When he lands in Charleston, there's a lot of leftover, really goodwill among people in the United States toward France for helping them win the American Revolution. The French 1778 join in an alliance with the United States, a formal one that involves a great deal of money and troops and the Navy. Worth mentioning that that assistance was critical to the United States winning this war against Britain. For Genet, he sees it as a treaty obligation of the United States to come to France's aid. I think you're absolutely right, Gary. Washington and all the members of the cabinet had to decide, do we still have a treaty obligation to come to France's aid when they're the ones who declared war against Great Britain? Or was that treaty of 1778 essentially a defensive treaty? There was a huge battle between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson over this issue. Jefferson says, Britain is our natural enemy. And later on, Hamilton, attacking both Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, said that Jefferson and Madison have a womanish attachment to France and a womanish resentment against Great Britain. This is the moment where all of you listening, if you are familiar with the musical, you can start singing Cabinet Battle Number 2 because this is exactly the argument that David is talking about. Genet set up what I like to call a privateer workshop 
in Charleston. And a privateer is a private ship that is sailing under letter of mark. Basically think of it as like a license from a foreign nation to go attack that nation's enemies. So in 1793, France hired private citizens to sail privateers to go attack British ships. Those British ships would be dragged back into harbor, sold off for goods, and then turned into another French privateer. Both sides did this at the time, except that Genet was hiring Americans to run these privateers. So all of this is happening in early April when Genet first arrived in Charleston. It might be worth pointing out that privateering is a common extension of warfare and a force multiplier in the 18th and 19th centuries. And there's, of course, economic incentive for anyone engaged in privateering because members of crews get a percentage of profit. The minister of Britain was complaining on a continuous basis about the United States allowing Genet's privateers to operate in American waters and then auction off the British cargo, which is largely things like rum and sugar from the Caribbean bound for Britain. So if you can wreck your enemy's economy, and that's what really privateers are all about, is to try to destroy your enemy's economic capacity to wage war, you may have won half the battle. Then, Genet, rather than sailing up to Philadelphia, which would have been the most expedient way to get to the seat of government at the time, decided to take the land route. He went very slowly. He attended every ball and celebration held in his honor for the next month and 10 days. And he did not get to Philadelphia to present his credentials to Washington and Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson until May 18th. So his behavior and his decorum is offensive because he has not made his way right away to Philadelphia. He has set out to create all of these privateers in Charleston. And those privateers had been super successful and had actually towed in some of their prizes to the port of Philadelphia before he even got there. So you can imagine the scene when he arrived at the president's house in Philadelphia to present his credentials after Washington had issued this proclamation of neutrality and the privateers are already there waiting for him. Not a great first start. So when Janae arrives in Philadelphia, his formal introduction to President Washington was a very cool meeting. And Janae sort of proceeds from there to completely misunderstand the way the machinery of the American government works. And to be fair, it's brand new. Let's at least acknowledge that. I think you make a great point. A really curious thing to me is that Britain, Spain, and the Netherlands all appointed ministers to the United States of America. But Genet was appointed as the minister of the French Republic to the Congress of the United States of North America, which goes to your point that we're a new nation And France and Genet, I think, made a fundamental mistake in not recognizing that under the Constitution, there's a new and potentially powerful chief executive. That is an excellent point. I think they were still looking at America as they had understood it during the war. And immediately thereafter, you know, what we call the Confederation Congress today was, of course, the body that exercised all these aspects of statecraft. They don't understand that this new constitution has a very different set of defined and separate powers. I hadn't thought of this exactly the way you said it, but I think that's right. They really miscalculated. Jefferson encouraged Washington and the other secretaries to give Genet a chance. When he had first arrived, the proclamation of neutrality had not yet been issued. So in theory, he didn't know what American policy was supposed to be. And of course, news traveled fairly slowly at that time. Although Hamilton, the Secretary of Treasury, and Henry Knox, the Secretary of War, were immediately eager to go to fisticuffs, Jefferson prevailed initially. He had a series of letter exchanges with Genet over the next several weeks 
which frankly didn't go very well because Janet set out a list of demands. He wanted the United States to immediately pay off all of its debts to France left over from the war, which would totally bankrupt the United States. So that was not really an option. Then he started lecturing Jefferson on how the Constitution worked, saying that the president was not in charge of foreign policy, Congress was in charge of foreign policy, and Washington should really call a session of Congress and get them to declare that they were on the side of France. Jefferson, to his credit, although he often disagreed with Washington, gave a very firm defense both of Washington's actions and executive authority in the Constitution, which must have been very annoying to him to have to explain his own government to a foreigner and to be lectured to in this fashion. Nonetheless, he did it and thought he had convinced Genet of the correct behavior of neutrality, that he could not arm any more privateers and it would be fine. Genet spoke flawless English. He's not even 30 years old. He's a charming young man. He was greeted by crowds of people who are coming out to see him. Imagine, he arrives in Philadelphia. His counterpart is Thomas Jefferson, is the Secretary of State. So he's in Jefferson's home in Philadelphia, where he's served French food on French plates, sits in French furniture with French art all around him, He's going to make this conclusion that he's among friends. And I think one of the things that Janae didn't quite get right is that Jefferson's appreciation for French culture didn't mean that he had changed his allegiance. Yes, his Francophilia is often caricatured as if he did not consider the interests of the United States first. Jefferson tried again and again to explain to Janae how things were different with the new United States under the Constitution. And Janae may have nodded his head at the time, but then went around Jefferson's back, quite frankly. That brings us to the end of June, when Washington learned that his plantation manager was dying. And so he quickly traveled back to Mount Vernon. Before he left, he met with Governor Thomas Mifflin, who was the governor of Pennsylvania. And Mifflin had received word that Genet was arming a new privateer. Philadelphia was very small at the time. So the British minister could walk from his home down to the port of Philadelphia and watch Genet loading cannons onto this new privateer. And he sent several letters to the Washington administration, to Jefferson, saying, you know, how is this neutral behavior? So when Mifflin told Washington about it, Washington basically said, you deal with it. He then left to go back to Mount Vernon. A couple of days later, Mifflin and the Pennsylvania Secretary of State, Alexander Dallas, received word that the ship was literally about to set sail. They rushed down to the port and they met with Genet and they tried to convince him that this would be an act of war and was a direct rejection of what Washington had instructed. Well, Genet, quote, flew into a great passion and lectured them about how they were not fulfilling their responsibilities under the Franco-American alliance, and he was just doing what was appropriate for American foreign policy. Outraged, Mifflin called up the state and local militias. He then sent word to Secretary of War Henry Knox and Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, explained what happened. In particular, he shared a very important detail which was that Genet had threatened to appeal directly to the American people. Jefferson immediately recognized that these words would be completely incendiary and would not only destroy Genet's cause, but would potentially destroy the Jeffersonian Republican cause, which was nominally allied with the French and very much anti-British. Jefferson then rushed down to the port and he met with Genet. He pushed Genet to promise that he wouldn't leave the port. And Genet wouldn't give his word that that would happen, but he assured Jefferson that the ship was many months away from being ready to set sail. So he didn't have anything to worry about. And Jefferson took that as good enough. He instructed Mifflin to send the militia home that the threat had passed. A couple days later, the cabinet met 
in Washington's absence to try and discuss what next step should be. Hamilton, who tended to be pretty militaristic, wanted to arm the small island at the mouth of the Philadelphia Harbor, such that if the ship did try and leave, there would be some sort of defensive maneuver in place. Jefferson felt really uncomfortable taking that step in Washington's absence, and so he urged Hamilton and Knox to wait until Washington returned. They agreed reluctantly to wait for Washington to get back. On July 10th, they woke up to discover that Genet had perhaps inappropriately described the state of the ship, and he had moved it farther downriver, meaning it was ready to set sail, which was not great news to have to share with the president when he arrived the following day on July 11th. Hamilton and Knox and Jefferson delivered their reports, as well as Mifflin and Dallas, and they tried to fill Washington in on what had happened since he had been gone. Once he delivered his report, Jefferson planned to go out to his house across the river. He was desperately in need of a vacation. And as he was heading out, he received a letter from Washington, which was one of the most angry letters Washington had ever written. Washington basically said, I don't care what your plans are for vacations. I would like you to come and report back to me and tell me what is going on and tell me how I'm supposed to act in this situation. Washington writes Jefferson, is the minister of the French Republic to defy the U.S. government with impunity and then threaten the executive with an appeal to the people? These are serious questions because Genet had said, if Washington won't side with France, then I'm going to take my case to the American people directly. Genet's behavior, certainly we look at this and go, what's he thinking? But also, I think if you're looking at the past, and you're doing some critical thinking, and something looks nuts, like why is somebody doing this? You really have to take a step back and say, well, what is the context? What is the framework that the person is operating from? What experiences have they had that may at least explain the position? Here we are in 1793, almost four years after the storming of the Bastille and the beginnings of what we call the French Revolution. And Genet is thinking much more like perhaps the political dynamics of his own country, where part of what brought about this revolution was the mobilization of the popular will, this idea that the people in concert can act in a way that reveals what's best. So Genet thinks if Washington is going to disregard the revolutionary significance and righteousness of defending the French cause, then I'll appeal to the American people. In the midst of all this, the shock from some people at Genet's behavior is such that Alexander Hamilton begins writing a series of articles in the Gazette of the United States in which he's explaining to the American people what the purpose of American neutrality is, but he also is informing the American people that Genet is defying President Washington, the hero of the American Revolution, our president. The series of seven letters that Hamilton writes are so powerful in their impact that it begins to turn public sentiment against Genet. And Jefferson, always using his hatchet man, James Madison, pleads with Madison. He says, for God's sake, take up your pen. And Madison very reluctantly mounts a rather weak response in the National Gazette. What's happening between Hamilton and Jefferson is an argument over the powers of the United States government. Hamilton's argument is that the executive under the Constitution is strong in decision-making and can make independent decisions of the Congress of the United States. Madison argues that as Congress has the power to declare war, then they must also have the power to declare neutrality. So this is this constitutional crisis. Who has the power? Is it the executive or is it Congress? And that debate, in a lot of ways, goes on to this very day. I think for us today, the executive of the United States in 2022 has such enormous power 
compared to the executive of the United States in its first years. It makes this debate one that to us seems almost superfluous, but at the time was critical. How will the executive function? This is the first time that this issue really has come up in the early history of the United States. And Washington is certainly understanding Hamilton's argument that I, George Washington, am the head of the government, not the Speaker of the House, not the President of the Senate, and I will use my executive power to the maximum ability that I can. I think that's well said and exactly right, and helps maybe us understand better some of the significance of this moment in ways that aren't apparent at first blush. On July 12th, they had a cabinet meeting to discuss Genet. And Jefferson's notes of this cabinet meeting are incredibly terse. There's none of the colorful detail that he usually provides, so I suspect Washington was not in a particularly good mood. They had a number of cabinet meetings over the next several weeks. And by the end of July, they had decided to request the recall of Genet from France, which was a huge moment in American foreign policy. They weren't sure if France would acknowledge that request, which would be incredibly insulting, basically akin to France saying, you are not a sovereign, independent nation. So it was a very tense moment. France did end up agreeing to the recall. And here's where the story takes sort of an interesting twist of fate. Poor Genet, what he doesn't realize is that his conservative Girondist party has been pushed aside by the Jacobins. And so there's a new and even more radical government in France. Yeah, that's right. In revolutionary France, over the course of the first few years of the revolution, there emerge two main factions who are both pro-revolution, but have very different ideas about how radical that revolution should be. There's a more conservative faction who are called the Girondists, and Genet is part of this group. They initially think of themselves as a a reform-minded kind of faction that would keep the monarchy, but create something more like, say, what Great Britain had. And then a faction that became known as the Jacobin. The Jacobins had a far more radical vision of the revolution, and they would prevail in a power struggle in 1793, at the same time that Genet has been sent to the United States. The faction Genet is allied with is very clearly on the losing end of this. This is the beginning of what we know of as the terror. Genet went back to France. He would have almost certainly been executed. On August 23rd, Washington approved the letter to inform the French government that they should recall Genet. But Genet is not informed to prevent him from intercepting its contents and trying to put himself in between the United States government and the French government. On September 7th, Jefferson reveals the contents of the letter to Genet, who is obviously upset and fuming over this. But then an enormous event happens on the 8th of September. Dr. Benjamin Rush, Jefferson's friend, a fellow signer of the Declaration of Independence, confirms that yellow fever has come again to Philadelphia, and hundreds and hundreds of people are falling ill. And by the end of the year, in 1793, 5,000 Philadelphians are dead. Virtually the entire government, including Jefferson, leaves Philadelphia to get away from the yellow fever epidemic, Genet leaves Philadelphia and goes to New York State. Washington knew that if he sent Genet back to France, Genet was likely to be beheaded at the guillotine because of the direction of the French Revolution. So he gave him permission to stay in the United States as a private citizen. Genet moved to New York. He ended up marrying the daughter of the governor of New York and lived the rest of his life as a relatively private citizen out of the public eye and didn't really cause any trouble after that month of activity. Washington and the cabinet met again to try and establish more concrete rules of neutrality. They came up with eight rules which dictated very clearly what foreign nations were and were not allowed to do in 
American ports. And they then sent those rules to Congress, which codified them the following spring. And that legislation governed periods of neutrality all the way up to the Civil War. When you come to Monticello to see the house, there is an engraving of Genet on display that was likely given to Jefferson by Genet when he comes to the United States. And it's one small reminder of the Genet affair at Monticello. This whole moment has in it, I think, many lessons for us about the kind of implicit debates that happen within the constitutional structure we still live under, the relationship of executive authority to popular will, and the idea that conducting foreign policy requires a concerted effort to be successful, and that that is something exercised through the executive. It's been a pleasure to talk with you, David, about this today. Someone whose grasp of early American history is tremendous. Hey, Gary, I really enjoyed the opportunity to get together with you and talk about this fascinating story and to discuss the legacy, really, which is that the power of the president is really established at that time frame. And we'd like to thank Lindsay Shervinsky. Lindsay is the author of The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution. And she did a terrific job outlining for us the key issues and moments in the Genet Affair. So we thank her for telling the story. And thank all of you for listening to this episode of In the Course of Human Events. 